Let me start with this. You've mentioned um, that your dad served in Vietnam. Um, what what did your what do you know about your dad's service in Vietnam? Well, he went over in 1962. Um, I was 16 when he went, so my memories are pretty clear of his time there. He went over late in 62, <clears throat> and in 63 he was a an army aviator. He flew mostly fixed wing when he was in Vietnam, but he um, did have some rotary wing time. Okay, but, and um, did he fly? Did he fly combat missions, or do you know? Do you have any? No, idea? back back then they weren't flying combat missions. That's, yeah, that's right. He flew, so early. Yeah, he flew advisors out to the field. Sometimes they'd pick up a group of Arvins and their families. Someplace I have a small black and white photo of him from the back standing there with his hands on his hips, watching somebody patch holes in a caribou. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So. Oh gosh, it was such a long war. And you were there um, almost a decade later and it was, it right. was still going. Did you and your dad ever swap memories about Vietnam? Of course, he was there very early. You were there pretty late. Did you, did you swap stories about it? We did. We did. In fact, um, it was, you know, pretty much all positive stories. One of the places that he flew in and out of frequently was the lot. And he absolutely loved it there because it was so beautiful. Hmm. I did not ever get to the lot when I was there. We didn't have the freedom to go where we wanted to go. We could only go where we were tasked to go. And when I went back, last well it's been two months now one of my main goals was to see the lot you know which i accomplished you know just wow. not uh it's different in some ways than when he was there but some things were the same that he talked about and, uh, and we talked about flying and um i can't think of specifically what we talked about but we did talk about it fairly yeah. often my father came home in 63 Wow! and he told me, he came home in early October. He told me to wait and see that this nation was getting ready to make the biggest mistake it had ever made. And less than two weeks later, the Xi'an regime was overthrown. He, because of the nature of his flying he, oh, and his Q clearance, he flew people that had knowledge or perhaps were part of things that were going on. So he knew that, that was going to happen. Oh, your dad knew that Xi'an was going to be overthrown. Do you recall, or you know, can, can you safely assume why your dad thought that that was such a, that would be a great mistake to overthrow Xi'an? Not so much to overthrow Xi'an, but to get involved in a war that the French could never win after all those years. Mm. Uh, he understood the Vietnamese better than a lot of people, not that he knew them, but he just had an innate understanding that they were fighting for their country yeah. and we would just get bogged down. Mm. And he was exactly right. And we talked about that quite a bit after I came back. You did? Yeah. Now, he was never worried about me going over, interestingly enough. Mm. Um, he felt I would be safe. During World War II, he had seen the donut dollies with their clubmobiles in Germany. So okay. he kind of understood what I was going to be go doing, not completely, but sure. Um, it was in World War II, they drove trucks and uh, buses that had been converted into machines, and they had donut machines and coffee machines and record players and sure. went out. Where our job was different, we flew to our assignments mostly in helicopters. And right. of course, Daddy, being a helicopter pilot, knew that was perfectly safe as long as we didn't get shot down, which never happened. Right. Wow. You say in in what you wrote that you were eager to go to to Vietnam. And you know, you say that when your dad came home in 63, you know. He, he didn't give you any detail about Xi'an, but he indicated, yeah, in his view, a big mistake was going to be made, and that was the coup, um, the overthrow of Xi'an. Um, 
you say that you really wanted to go. Um, what was it that made you want to go to Vietnam? Well, the differing opinions of it. My father was against the war. I was in college. And of course, professors and college students were against the war for different reasons. But I was dating officers at Fort Benning that had been there, a lot of special forces officers now that we're going to give them democracy. We're going to save them. Mm. I wanted to go find out why we were really there. And I never did. What I did find out when I got there was I absolutely loved my job. I loved going out to fire bases or LZs, talking to the guys, playing our games. You know, I talk, mentioned programming. If you've talked to other donut dollies, you've probably heard that. Get it, getting them to smile, to laugh, to forget mm. just for a little while what was going on around them and what they faced every day. What what was programming? You you used that term. What what did that what did that term mean for you? We built game type activities, uh, mostly based on TV shows like Match Game or Jeopardy or things like that. Yeah. And we literally <clears throat> created our own sets of questions. Well, sometimes we borrow them from people that had done it before. Right. But we built yeah. our board games and everything. And going through all these activities was called programming. Yeah. As opposed to playing silly games. Right now, I've seen a, a, a photo of. I, I assume you're you're in the photo. Um, there are I don't know six or seven donut dollies. I'm assuming on a stage, and they have masks of peanut characters. Is is that is that related to programming as well, or what was? It that? is, but that was very specialized. Rarely did we go out at more than two. That was Christmas 1969. <clears throat> a very talented member of my unit had rewritten for the eight of us a Charlie Brown's Christmas and mm -hmm. we were wearing masks from the peanut characters. Right. And we all had our role. That was programming, but it was a very special thing. We went out as Christmas Day, I think we went to six different fire bases. Wow. Wow. Really did, uh, quite a day. I'll bet. Did did you feel that part of your mission in um, South Vietnam as a Donut Dolly was not only to take the minds of the guys off of combat or whatever other stresses they were dealing with for a moment, but also to, did you consciously feel that another of your missions was just to remind them of home? And the, the, the reason I ask that is often combat vets will say that after a while you start feeling like there is no other world, that you know, they'll use that phrase, the world, referring to the U.S. or to the outside. Mm -hmm. But after a while, there's this feeling like, you know, this is all there is, just South Vietnam. Was that in your mind? I want to remind these guys of home. It, it very much was. We, um, well, there's a poem, and I can't remember it all, but it's a touch of home in a combat zone, a smiling face on a bleak fire base. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't remember the last name, but that's what we were was to provide a touch of home. Yeah. And we, I don't know what the other girls did. And we did, it wasn't done to be sex or anything. But when we get to a new place, like on a large fire base, we might go around to several different units. I carried a tube of pink lipstick in my pocket. To this day, I can't figure out why it never melted. Yeah. And yeah, right. as we were getting ready, I would put it on because. I had done it one time unintentionally or unknowingly what it meant. And some of the guys said, oh, my mom used to do that. My sister mm -hmm. used to do that. My girlfriend used to do that. And that was part of home to them. So I started doing that on a regular basis. Wow. And, and you know, it was just a little thing, but it, you know, it meant something to some of them. Did you ever have this experience as a, a young woman from the United States of, um, It'll sound strange as I try to describe it, but um, you know, maybe especially if you're interacting with guys who've been out in the field for a long time, um, and the only other Americans they've seen are the dirty, smelly guys they've been with out in the field, and and all of a sudden they see this donut dolly speaking English and with an American accent. 
did you sometimes almost feel like you were almost like an object of reverence even an object of worship would be too strong but the, the reason I ask is I, I remember I was peacetime navy but I remember an experience where um, after being out at sea for a long time, we went into a port and we stumbled across an Amer a young American woman. And I very distinctly remember a group of us just kind of gathering around her and you know, just looking at her as sort of a, a thing of wonder because we hadn't seen anything like this for, for months. Um, did you ever experience that sort of thing where you felt like you're almost an object of reverence? I never did. No. I think some of the girls did and let it get to them and I'm not sure what kind of way, but you know, where when they came back to the States, most of us were not beautiful. We were mm -hmm. ordinary American girls. There were some yeah. that were very beautiful and some that were very homely and some that were just average looking. Just an ordinary I, group of people. But yeah, they some of them and I've gotten this anecdotally from others, um they did get a sense of admiration, not so much reverence, but admiration. Mm -hmm. They were special. And then when they came back to the States and they were back to their old selves, mm -hmm. they really, you know, where they didn't get a lot of attention from oh. guys. It was hard on them. Sure. I had spent a good part of my teenage later teenage years and college years at Fort Benning, I dated a lot of guys. So that didn't have that same impression for me. I see. In what you wrote, you used the phrase at least a couple of times. I can't remember if it's my guys or our guys, as you reflect back on the guys in Vietnam. I think it's my guys referring to, you know, thinking about my guys. Well, there were certain times when I definitely thought of them as my guys. I don't, I can't remember what I wrote now in there, but when I got back to the States in San Francisco, I saw the newspaper, they'd gone to Cambodia, the 25th Infantry, and it was like, those are my guys. I need to be there with them or for mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. But most of us think of them as our guys. They were, they were our guys. So what does that mean, our guys? Because that, that implies a certain feeling of connection with them, a feeling of, if I can use the phrase, a certain sense of tenderness toward them, which especially for the combat guys would maybe seem strange because I mean, that's, it's such an awful world they're in and it's such a hard context. What is that, what sentiments, what ideas does that term my guys conjure in your mind? It just means they were the people that we were there for mm. to try to give them, you know, the breaks, the um, moments of fun or whatever, that they were very special to us. Um, mm. I honestly think that that phrase has become used more since then as we all talk with each other than one that we actually used over there. It must have felt like very meaningful work. The most meaningful I've ever done. Yeah. Why do you say that? Just because we had an opportunity to give something of ourselves to people that really needed it at that time. You know, mm -hmm. the girl, like I said, with the lipstick, the girl next door. Yeah. You know, their fiance, their wife, their mother, their cousin, whatever. We were there to represent home. And yeah. I think we did a pretty good job of that. What sorts of things have you heard from veterans since the war? I, I imagine you've had interactions with Vietnam vets since the war and have told them you were down at Dolly. What sort of things have you heard from them? In the early years, we didn't talk about it much, even among ourselves. Yeah. Um, just like a lot of the guys, we just sort of withdrew and put it behind us. Since then, oh my gosh, the we're getting so much appreciation now that we didn't get before. It's almost overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Although there are those naysayers that say, well, they were only there for the officers. They knew where the money was. You know, the, 
the really ugly comments, but those are few and far between. I went to a reunion in 2012 with the Ghost Riders, which was a unit out of 101st. And there was this one woman there that just kept talking to us and talking to us because her husband had thought so much of the donut dollies. He was a pilot. And she said after a while, she could tell by the tone of his letters whether he'd flown the donut dollies that day or not, because when he flown donut dollies, his letters were always positive and upbeat. And on other days there was, we flew these missions and it was horrible and da, 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 you know, just really down. And she was just absolutely fascinated by us, you know, our having been over there. And wow. so many wives and women had never heard of us before. Now they're hearing about us and they're just amazed. Yeah, but yeah. yeah. It's a program that ended in 1972 and isn't appropriate anymore because you've got zoom calls you've got facetime you've got even right. more telephone time so sure. there's that connection with home that they didn't have back in vietnam right yeah um i, I want to ask you really kind of go back to something basic and ask you ask you how you got into the donut dolly project how you became part of that in the first place but i, I want to pick up first on um but you've, you've mentioned that you were recently back in Vietnam. Was this your first time back to Vietnam? Since? Fortunately, yes, and it will be my last time. But what, what because I've wanted to go for years, but I Why just did you want to go, go back? Because when I was there, I, could, I didn't get to go out in the countryside or anything. We always flew. We weren't allowed to travel by roads in most places. Mm. I hadn't really seen it, but yet, except from the air. But I remember sitting at the beach at Chulai one day and looking up at the point where the 91st of Ak Hospital was and looking back at the mountains and thinking, and then at the ocean, I mean, I was literally on a beach and thinking, what a fabulous resort this would be. Mm. Over the years, I always wondered what was happening in Vietnam, how they were managing, whether they were prospering or not, because I just felt that there was more to the Vietnamese people than black market and Viet Cong. And I just felt like they could accomplish something. And I always wanted to see what became of Vietnam. And what did you discover? I, did, I discovered that, wow, you know, it's a communist country but in name only, they are very capitalistic. There are no more thatched roof houses, everything's cement. There are booming industries. Their rice production has gone up to where they now export 40% of the rice in the world. Wow. Uh, the mm. cars and motorcycles are amazing. Mm. It, they are so friendly. Mm. Most Vietnamese don't remember the war, don't know anything about it. Did you pick that up? My my sense is that the Vietnam War is much more alive in the United States than it is in Vietnam. Would tend to agree with that. Yeah, yeah. But we did have one experience that was really interesting. Uh, I'm sure you've read in some of the books where people have gone back and met up with soldiers they fought with and everything. And I was over there as a combatant and it, I didn't care to do that, but we were going to a memorial park up at Quang Tree. Mm. We, well, of course I was a civilian, but the men had been advised that it was not good to wear anything reminiscent of the war, not your Vietnam War hats or anything. Sure. And they didn't, but the men on the group tour were mostly older men. And as we were going in, there was a group coming out of older men with their North Vietnamese hats. Oh, wow. Yeah, just like if you go to the wall, you see guys with their booming sure. hats with their other hats on. Right. And they had on their hats and I'm not sure who started, but it was smiling and waving and nodding and greeting and wow. just friendly and beautiful. So there were Vietnamese, presumably North Vietnamese who had been with the North Vietnamese army they were there, and and then these American vets were there, but it was a it was a pleasant interaction. It was very nice. Wow! I got chills at the time; almost cried. Wow! 
because it was just so like, yeah, it's over. It's, it's just history. Yeah. Did that change your perspective? Because you, you wrote that, you know, I think you used a, a phrase that's often used by folks who served in Vietnam, that the, that the war was a complete waste. I think you say total waste. Do you, does the time you spent in Vietnam, does that alter your perception a little bit or, or does that perception hold? That holds, the war was a waste. Mm. Too many people were killed on both sides for no good reason. Vietnam could have become what it is now without the war. We could have done without the wall and all those names. Yeah. Yeah, my, yeah that will never change. Yeah. We, I still want to get back to how you got into the Donut Dollars in the first place, but here's another, another question. What is your very first memory arriving in Vietnam? You're there actually two tours, 6970 and then 7071. What do you remember about your very first personal experience of Vietnam? Well, mine is so weird that it would be unlike anybody else had. Um, and let me go back to how I got to Vietnam, how I got to the Red Cross program, because this ties in. Sure, let's do that. I was planning on going into the Air Force in intelligence. I'd taken the Air Force officers qualifying test, passed it, had my assignment, had my reporting date to Randolph Air Force Base. Found out that at that time, they were not sending women, <clears throat> female officers in intelligence to Vietnam. And yet that was my goal, was to get to Vietnam, to try to find out why we were there. What was going on? And I was just devastated because I had no other plans for graduation. So I was taking a class for uh, recreation for social workers. And there was a man in my class that was working on his master's in social work. And we were on the same, we were in groups where we did our little projects. And I was moaning to him about, I wasn't going to be able to, I didn't want to go into the Air Force because I couldn't do what I wanted to do. And he said, well, have you ever thought about the Red Cross? They have a program in Vietnam. I said, well, I'm not a um, hospital social worker. And he said, no, this is a recreation program. So he told me all about it. We talked about it. He sent me to um, Atlanta. He told me he worked up there when he was not on his educational sabbatical. So I went up to Atlanta and I wasn't even interviewed in Atlanta like all the other girls were. I just signed the papers and got myself ready to go. Wow. Well, that was unusual because he was actually in person. Back then it was called personnel, not HR, in, per in the personnel office up there. So all these conversations we'd had were, and working on the projects were my interview. Oh, wow. So it was really a little different. Well, when we got off the plane in Saigon, here I was, Army Brad had seen a lot of the uniforms in my life. There was this wall of OD green that I had never seen the likes of. And I was a big, brave person that was the first one in our group off the plane. And the past kind of split. And all of a sudden, this guy in OD green steps out, reaches around, and grabs me. All I could think of was Mary Louise was right. They're all animals. She was the head of the program in our training. And it was Ernie. He had not told me he was being stationed over there in per the personnel office. Oh, really? Oh, that was and he'd guy. come to the plane to meet me. Oh, wow. So that was my first impression was the guys were all animals. But it was so untrue. Yeah. But the smells, the smells. I know you've heard this. Yeah, oh, sure. God, the smells were just so different yeah. than anything I'd ever experienced. Now, you, you flew into Tensinet. You flew into the Tansonet Airport. Tansonet, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the um, airport there in, in Saigon. Right. Um, the smells, I imagine the heat and the humidity struck you pretty, oh, pretty quickly. Getting off that plane was like being smacked up by something physical. 
with the heat and humidity. You, in what you write about your experience in Vietnam, you make a very clear distinction between your first tour and your second tour. And you say that you would happily do your first tour again, but that you would not at all be interested in redoing your second tour. If I have it right, your first tour, 6970, you're, you're in Chulai and Kuchi. 7071, you're in Bearcat, in the, uh, Da Nang, and Fuloi. What made these two um, tours so, so different for you? Initially, it was that even though I consciously realized that I would, when I went back, I would be working in a service club and I would be flying around every day. It's still that part of the excitement of the job really kind of weighed on me. The second part, in just a very few months, there was only five months between my two tours. Yeah. And in that time, the drug use had increased exponentially. The morale had dropped exponentially. It was like a different place. When I was at the service club, one of the first days I was there, this guy walked over to me and said, weren't you a donut dolly? Mm. <laughs> I said, yeah, and he was from, his unit had been with the 9th Infantry Division, and when I was with the 25th, two-thirds of the 9th had gone home, and one brigade was left, so we went down to see them, and he was in that group. Yeah. And he said, you won't believe what it's like down. He sat down and told me about the heavy drug use, you know, the heroin, the um, something else. Heroin and opium, of course, oh. heroin is made from opium, but you know, they were getting the pure opium. When I was there, a lot of the guys smoked grass, but that was it, pretty much. On the first tour? On the first tour. When I got down to Fuloy, the drugs down there were even worse. It was really, really bad. The morale was so bad. It was just hard to get people to smile. We'd have floor shows and things. They'd come to the service club, but Sometimes things would get pretty rowdy, things I hadn't ever seen before. A commanding officer came in, a new commanding officer, and he had a three by three by three box built out of plexiglass with a hole in the top. And he said his goal was to fill that box with the opium, little opium containers that, and heroin containers they had before he left. In less than six weeks, it was full. And these were things that he confiscated? It, not he personally, but oh, you know, his, the MPs, uh, other officers and things that confiscated. I, my morale was going downhill just as bad. Um, I had my own stereo system in the service club and it got stolen. Um, some of the guys were just, I know it's because oh. of the drugs, but they were just really rude. I was not dealing well with that. And one day I need, I wanted to go back over to Bearcat. I can't remember now why, but I hopped to ride on a bus, a truck, a three quarter ton truck that was going over. And there were several guys on it. And one of them, they were talking and it had to do with the drugs. And one of them told me if I said anything, I was dead. Wow. Well, when I got to Bearcat, <clears throat> I called back over and asked for a helicopter to come get me, which they did. But I was mentally spiraling down by that time. And it was like, I have to go. I have to go home. And I'd been there 10 months. And wow. you, normally, if you were quitting, they made you pay your own way home and everything. But they considered that a mental health issue and let wow. me go. But it was and I was really a mess when I came home. My parents thought I was using drugs, which I had not. But I was just, I was just a mess. And is that because, I mean, here's my, here's my thought, and I'm interested in hearing your response. 69, 70, you know, I think by the time we get into 70, this is harder maybe, but 69, early 70, 
um, you know, maybe we can still say, you know, this thing is winnable. By the time we get into later 70s, 71, we've got the Vietnamization process underway. Not many people have confidence that the South Vietnamese forces are going to be able to hold. There's this feeling, you hear it from combat vets, I don't want to be the last one to die in this place before we get out. Was there just a feeling in the first tour that, you know, this war is kind of crazy, but maybe it's winnable. In the second tour, there's absolutely no way this thing can be won. Um, and that's what accounts for what you're kind of just, I mean, what you're describing sounds like almost a psychological collapse taking place among the troops. Does, does, that, does that kind of make sense to partly explain the difference between the two tours? I think it does to a point by early 70s, the feeling that we weren't going to win was there because Nixon was doing the withdrawal right. already. Yeah, right. he started in July announced it, but it was getting faster and faster. So there were fewer and fewer people um, over there. But by the time I got back, yes, it was, nobody thought we were going to win the war at that point. You know, you, wow. I'm sure you heard guys say that were there earlier. Well, we were winning when I left, mm. you know, which is just a sort of a sarcastic. Right, sure. Thing, but it was also sort of a true feeling that, Early on, we did expect to win. I'm not sure what winning would have entailed, but uh, yeah. But anyway, but yeah, it was just really different. Not only over there, but the demonstrations back in the states. Guys hearing stories of their buddies having gone home and been spit on and called names. I'm not sure how much of that actually happened. I think the rumors sort of spread about it more than the actuality, but I'm sure it did happen at some point, you know, being called baby killers and stuff. So that, you know, just really brought the guys down. So wow. you know, it, was, wow. it was tough for them. Um, you've said a little bit about your donut dolly work in the first tour, and then, and then you're working in the service clubs the second tour. Could you just give us a little more detail to sort of um, describing the basics of, of, you know, if there was any such thing as a typical day, what would a typical day be like in the first tour and what would a typical day be like in the second tour? Well, a typical day in the first tour would be flying to three, four, five fire bases or going out to one large one going to different units with our programs that we built on weekends and evenings, we would work on building those programs. Mm -hmm. um, now this was for me, this was not for every donut dolly because they had centers in some places where were very much like service clubs. Mm -hmm. But I just happened to be, in my opinion, lucky enough to be stationed with two infantry units and they were really in some ways the most fun and the greatest guys ever. Mm -hmm. um, with the service club, a typical day would be during the daytime, guys would come in, we'd shoot pool, play ping pong, whatever. And in the evenings, we would have a special program. I would do um, once a month, I'd have a dinner kind of activity where this is crazy. We got a um, mess sergeant to make pizza dough and took it down to the service club, and we all everybody had made their own pizzas with all the toppings on then walked up the street to the mess hall to, to cook it. Um, we had Spanish food one night. One of the craziest things I ever did was I was, I, the guys kept asking me to have soul food and okay, I managed to from the um, commissary in Saigon get collard greens. I got cornbread mix from my mom, sent it over there. I can't remember what else we had, but one of the mess sergeants got, oh, what's it called? The awful smelly stuff made from pigs. And that's ridiculous. I can't remember that now. Chitlins. Oh, okay, yeah. 
And he had to get up at three o'clock in the morning to cook them because they smelled so bad. He had to have them finished before the guys came in for breakfast. And so we had our, we had all that stuff and nobody was eating the chitlins. I asked one of the guys, I said, you know, I've got all the soul food. I've got chitlins. What's going on? He says, we don't need that shit. We just wanted to know if you'd make it for us. Oh, really? yeah, but uh, but uh, at least once a week we'd have bingo a couple times a month we'd have a floor show that we get through army special services show periods we'd have um different kinds of games and activities tie-dye t-shirts nice i had to get white t-shirts from the states because by that time they were all being issued green ones during the daytime for the most part there were no special activities just a place for them to come wow. get books out of the library area play pool do whatever they want to do mm -hmm. sometimes just sit and of course we always had music playing until the stereo got stolen oh gosh so it sounds like the second tour um in addition to being um just harder because of what was going on it sounds like it might have been just less personally exciting as well because you're not it sounds like in the first tour you're getting on helicopters a lot and going to new places into new environments and was that part of the difference as well well they weren't always new places a lot of times they were but yes the excitement of getting on a helicopter at 5 30 or 6 o'clock in the morning and being out all day and coming back home in a helicopter there was just nothing like that yeah. And maybe it meant more to me because my father was a helicopter pilot and I knew a lot about them. Mm. But on the other hand, it was just the constant difference. Whereas in the service club, it was a little more stagnant. You know, I mean, we had all these different activities, but they were repeats, mm. you know, on a regular basis. Yeah, the guys loved the bingo games and winning little prizes. Yeah. But they seemed to not, you know, in neither job did we reach all of the guys. There were some that didn't think we belonged over there. There were some that I had one guy say, I, I couldn't sit in front of y'all because I'd be turned on. I mean, that was, a, mm. he told me that later, not over there. You know, he, mm. so he always just stayed back. I don't know what yeah. the other reasons were. Some of the games were kind of silly, but the ones we reached, fine. They, they had smiles on their faces, you know. Sure. There were times when we go out to program and like that picture I sent with the guys on San Juan Hill where we didn't program that day. I'd been sitting there just listening to them talk mm. about the buddy that was killed and the one, others and everything when somebody asked to take the picture. We did we we listened. If a guy had gotten a Dear John letter and all his friends were commiserating with him. We listened. Sometimes that was the most important thing we could do was listen. I'm looking at the photo that you sent and this is on, um, this is the, the guys who'd come in out of the field. They had lost one in a firefight and I think they were wounded as well. Um, and you're among them and you say that you know, look, looking at the photo now, you feel a little uncomfortable because, you know, you're smiling. Um, I imagine that was probably something that was just sort of automatic for you, given your job. When, when there's a camera, that's what you do. But, but tell us, you know, you were just saying a little bit, but, you know, as we look at this photo, um, what are the memories that come to mind of the story that played out that this photo was part of? That was a group, um, they were from four, I, I forgot what the company was, they were fourth of the third, and San Juan Hill was just a beautiful, had beautiful vistas. Yeah. And usually when we were down there, we had really good participation in our programs. And that day, when we got there, the air felt different. You know, the, there was just a different aura. And the sergeant came over and told us basically what had happened. And he said, don't expect much participation because the guys just aren't up for it. So, mm -hmm. you know, we, 
I was with another girl, Karen, and we spent time, you know, separately listening to different groups talk. Those guys in that picture were some that I talked to more than others when we were down there. Um, I can't tell you names because I don't know if you heard this Mother Donut Dollies, but we didn't try to remember people's names because if, or even get their names because, oh, maybe we knew them by a nickname or something, but you didn't want to go back and you didn't see somebody and say, well, what happened to so-and-so and have them tell you, mm. you got blown away. Mm. So names, I can go to the wall and know that in that 69, 70 period, there are a lot of people I saw, but I don't know who they were. Mm. You know, because we just didn't get names, but it was just a different kind of day. But yes, smiling was part of our job, mm -hmm. but it wasn't the hard part. It was pretty easy, but it, it did become almost automatic, too. I didn't smile as much as some of the other girls. And somebody mentioned it to me once. And I said, well, I can put a plastic smile on or save it for the real one times. Mm -hmm. But, that, but it, it got my attention. I started smiling more. The plastic smile went mm. into place. You, you mentioned that part of your job was listening. You're listening to these guys talk. Now we're talking about, you know, listening that took place decades ago. Um, is there any particular thing you remember a soldier telling you that really does stick in your mind? that same group he's not in the picture there was a guy that was he wasn't a sniper i've forgotten what his job title was well he, he was a love and bravo but he was basically an assassin and you know he'd be in a bush or behind a tree and you know just reach out catch a Viet Cong coming by and slit their throats and he, he was talking to us one day and I said, isn't it hard to do that? He says, no, I like to kill. Mm. Mm. Yet strangely enough, he and I became close friends and stayed friends until the eighties. But he had a lot of mental health problems that were getting worse and I had to withdraw from the friendship. But his little lady married and I became friends. You know, it, it was just sad. Do you, you asked him that question, he said no. And actually, you hear this a lot from combat vets. Of course, it's not something folks, you know, want to say or will often volunteer. But, you know, combat does something to a person and the capacity to kill another human being, that's a lot of power. That kind of power can be intoxicating. When you heard him say that, I'm interested first in what your own reaction was. And then, I mean, a question I have is, I mean, did that send a message to you about this is what war does to people? You know, this is, this is the impact that war can have on people. And then I'm interested in what, if you have any recollection of what your own response was when he said, when he said, who said that to you at the time i wasn't wise enough to think this is what war does to people mm. i was just shocked and i honestly don't remember if i answered or just turned away and talked to other people but i remember him saying that and just being shocked because mm. he was such a gentle person mm -hmm. you know what in my previous right? conversations it was just yeah. It was wow. just a blowing away moment. You've written that in your own case, you, um, well, I think you've, you've, you've attached that, that, um, that label to yourself, the label of PTSD or the diagnosis of that to yourself. Um, have you been formally, um, I mean, is that a formal diagnosis or is this a conclusion you've come to on your own? I was in total denial about having PTSD. I didn't have it. I accepted the fact that people had it. I didn't have it. Um, I was having some issues, some explosive 
moments at work that were getting worse. And are you familiar with employee assistance programs? Uh, a lot of generally, but a lot of places have them. And I was referred to counseling through the employee assistance program. The counselor that I had specialized in PTSD, but she'd never treated a Vietnam veteran. And she said, she said, I don't know how to tell you this, but you do have PTSD. And I was really kind of stunned, but with the recognition and the continuing counseling, and she did not believe in going back to try to find the moment that it happened or anything, because a lot of things have happened to me through my life. So there might not have been one moment. It might've just been a buildup, mm -hmm. but she taught me a lot about how to divert when things started getting to me. So I didn't have my outward explosions. Mm -hmm. And then she found out she went back over the paperwork I'd filled out before I went, because it was many, many pages. And she saw in there where it said, were you ever in the military? And I said, no. And then it said, she missed the part where it said, were you ever in a combat zone? And I said, yes. Oh. And so she had to find out what all that was about. And the next time I saw her, this is so funny because it's never happened quite like this again. She would meet me early at eight o'clock, which was before she started. So I didn't have to miss a lot of work. And I, she had just pulled into the parking lot. I pulled in the parking lot beside her. A van pulls in and pulls to the other side of the parking lot. And the guy hops out and runs over to me and yells, I've wanted to hug a donut dollar for the last 30 years. And just gives me this oh. great big hug. And you know, she's like, what? You know, because by that time she knew the term donut dolly. Oh. And he was a pilot. He was a helicopter pilot. Wow. And he said, I've been following you for three miles no. <laughs> because I had a license tag that said Vietnam Donut Dolly that somebody oh, gave right. me. Oh, wow. Wow. Oh, that, that was wow. That was really a rewarding experience, <laughs> I tell you. Wow. But wow. It, it sort of helped her see why I hung on to that title. And, you know. Well, and you and you you've said it was the most meaningful work you ever you ever did. Um, so you said that there's no particular incident that took place in Vietnam, but you you attach the PTSD to, and that other things have happened not related to your service in Vietnam. But as you look back on your two tours in Vietnam, is there anything you've identified that you would say, well, this probably contributed. This was a significant contributor from that time in, in Vietnam. Have you identified one or two things? One thing that I think had a lot to do with it was, it was literally the night before I was leaving to come home the second time. And there, we lived in a house over here that, well, it was just a house over here. And then over here was a aviation unit, the officer's quarters. And a couple of the guys had a lot of um, music that I wanted. And they were taped, and the three of us were sitting in one guy's room when we heard an explosion, and then the sirens went off. Mm -hmm. And it was way across the way. And when we ran outside, not too far off, you could see explosions, and it was coming close. So it looked like a sapper attack. And one of the guys gave me a gun and threw me into the bunker. Wow literally threw me into the bunker and said, use this if you have to. And I was familiar enough with guns from earlier years to know how to shoot it. It was, a, it was only a 45, but you know, they could do some damage. And I was in there for a couple of hours before things settled down, but we had a saber attack on the base, but I have, was, I was scared. I was really scared. You know, there were people running between their quarters, our house, and the service club. I didn't even know who they were because I was sitting in the middle of the bunker ready to turn around and shoot either direction. Wow. But it was really a bizarre experience, especially in my frame of mind as I 
it was and I was leaving the next day. Wow. You know? And this so, was the this was the second tour? Second tour. Boy, and I mean you were you were very eager to get out at that point. So to have this experience right at right at the end of your second yeah. tour. Yeah. Two years in Vietnam, I'd never had anything like that happen. Wow. You also suggest in what you've written that you think you may have some physical conditions related to Agent Orange. Is, is that right? Yeah. Um, I was that now I'm not real lightweight as you can tell, but mm. I was diagnosed with uh, type two diabetes in 2010. Nobody in my family has ever had diabetes before. And I come from a, from a family of big eaters and lots of sweets and desserts and things. Um, I have peripheral neuropathy in my feet. I can step on a piece of glass and not even feel it. What else? Something else. Oh, low thyroid, which is very common with women who have served and been exposed to Agent Orange. Um, Sometime in the early teens of this century, I can't remember when, the nurse practitioner at my doctor's office said, we need to watch your thyroid. It, it's looking a little low. And the next time I went in and she looked at the blood work, she said, oh my God, your thyroid is not working at all. It had just quit. Several women have had... Um, thyroid problems of different kinds, but the low thyroid is Agent Orange related. So that's three conditions I have that I know of that are Agent Orange related. Were they caused by Agent Orange? We can never prove it, but I'm pretty sure. Now, of course, if you were a military veteran who had served in Vietnam with these symptoms, likely the VA would say that there's some connection to Agent Orange. How, how do things go for, uh, for you as a Donut Dolly, as one who worked in a, a, a service club? Um, what, what assistance is there for you not having been formal military? My insurance, my Medicare, there is nothing from the VA that mm. we have access to. We just have to hope to find doctors who are familiar enough with Agent Orange to see the correlation, or if nothing else, just know how to treat the problem. Wow. Wow. When you look back on this whole story, I mean, I guess in your case, starting with your dad going to Vietnam in 62, you were there in 69, 70, back in 70, 71. You describe the, the real transition you see um, in that latter part of the war. Um, and then all the decades since, the building of the Vietnam Wall, you mentioned the, the Women's Memorial there um, near the wall. This whole Vietnam story that's played out, even, even up to your recent trip to Vietnam and this experience you had with the U.S. veterans and with the Vietnamese veterans and the the interaction they had. Um, I mean, we're talking about decades here, a story that's unfolded in your life over many decades. When you put it all together, is there a particular thought, a particular idea, that a particular theme that you say just kind of pulls it all together? Is there one sort of overriding theme, one overriding idea? I guess maybe the way to set it up, would, you know, I put you in front of a group, but unfortunately you only have three minutes to, to pull it all together for this group of folks about your relationship with Vietnam, starting in with your dad in 62. Um, what, what summary thought would you, would you have? I can't think of any particular thought, but what I can say is that I don't think there's a day that goes by that I don't think, even for just a minute, about something in Vietnam. I just can't let it go. I, you know, I just can't walk away and say it's over, it's past, because 
I care. And like one night on Facebook, there was a guy that was just, I mean, he, he was, he was on the bridge for all practical purposes, ready to jump. And to Google, I found his phone number and called him and talked to him for about four hours. Wow. And the next day he went back to the VA and said he needed a counselor and he's doing fine now. Wow. So it's, you know, it's hmm. always in my head one way or another. Every day. Does it also show up in your dreams? No. Really? That's interesting. I almost never remember any dreams. Okay. Unlike a lot of the guys, I just don't have dreams. Yeah. What would you say, sort of a slightly different question, if I put you in front of a, a group of young people, students, um, what would you say to them if the task was, you know, what do you think these young people should know about the Vietnam War, about that whole Vietnam era? What would you say to them? I would tell them to work for peace. That being in the military is a noble occupation, but they should hope that it remains a peacekeeping force and not a war force. Yeah. I'm I'm really a pacifist now. And is that substantially as a result of what you experienced in Vietnam? I think I was to a point before then, but after Vietnam, very much so. But, well, I really do appreciate you taking this time. Um, thank you for what you've written. Thank you for this time. Thank you for what you did in, in Vietnam. I'm sure there are still veterans all around who um, they, they wouldn't perhaps recognize you and they don't remember your name, but they have fond memories of, um, of those moments when you, you know, the, the work that you did helped to take their mind off of what they were dealing with over there. So I think so. Yeah. And it, it makes me feel good because it means we did our job. <laughs>